everyone. Hope you guys are having a great weekend. Um, it's uh, Friday night and I have nothing else better to do uh, after I did the uh, tear apart of the oil filter. Uh, so I thought I'd do a quick uh, cleaning of the engine bay of the Civic. And, um, and and as I do it, I can just show you guys what I usually use. I just use a, a b bit of a, a rag sort of thing and uh, just basically wrap it around my hand. I have always wear gloves. And uh, what I have on here is just a bit of a uh, cleaning solution, uh, like a mixture of uh, alcohol and um, alcohol and a little bit of uh, 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 oil. There's probably a little bit of oil on this one because I've been using it to wipe, you know, sort of the, the excess oil and whatnot. So there is going to be a little bit of oil. That's why it shines it up a little bit. Um, oil, I mean, some will say don't use oil because then it dries up plastics. But then again, you know what? Everything in here is going to dry up. It's just a matter of fact because um, this, the engines get hot. And as they get hot, uh, it will heat up plastic. And then it heats it up and then it cools down, heats up. And it goes through the cycles of heat, right? And typically, you know, plastics will start to break down regardless of whether you get any oil on it or not. So, um yeah, so here's the uh, this this is the this is the intake box. As you can see, that there's two quick release parts there, and I think you could just pull out the pull out. Uh, there might be a screw, but another piece over here that you should be able to just pop off the air box. Let's see why isn't that coming off? So pop off pop off here and you should be able to just all right yeah so i just had to use my trouble light but yeah th this is this one's quick release so basically uh, you pop these two off and then you just pull um or push to the left all right so once you push to the left you're basically able to grab the air box um filter element so that's the other side what I'm gonna do is I'll vacuum out this stuff you see it's just loose dust you see that and um, yeah it's you know what I could probably replace it soon but um, it's not very bad I've seen actually seen a lot worse so I'm just gonna put this aside to remind myself to put that back in and to uh, put the box back in you just basically slide to the right and then these two um, clip clips so I'm just gonna leave it loose um, and I'm just gonna make a personal note that I'm gonna make sure I put that filter back in because running the engine without the air filter element is not a good idea so this is this one here is the fuse box so hopefully you guys can see that so yeah so this this one right here is the fuse box, and uh, I'm not going to open it, but um, uh, basically I remember it is the fuse box because I have a fuse running in here for my sound system, and right here, right here. But anyways, uh, I don't really want to pull it apart, but uh, trust me when I say that, that's the fuse box. Um, there's more fuses inside the car, and uh, this one is for um that is you know located in here typically is going to be controlling the ignition and whatnot right um and then this here of course is the battery and i like to always wipe around the battery you know just make sure there's no leaks or anything like that and you see there's a bit of dust this engine compartments typically get quite dusty um it's just the nature of you know anything that goes down the road at you know um quick speed air goes in there all sorts of things go in to the engine bay uh, engine bays are not waterproof they yeah, water actually splashes in from the bottom and whatnot so there's quite a lot of uh, um, things that are going on in here so that's the battery here's the power steering fluid right here power steering fluid and of course you got the engine right here ignition coils one two three four 
ignition coils, which in which case you loosen these off, take off this plug, and underneath you will have your uh, spark plugs. And obviously I don't wanna pull those out, uh, but uh, so this is the uh, top end of the engine. And, um, uh, and this is, this is where the um, parts where there's the could there's a gasket right between here and the it's a pl plastic cover. There's a gasket down here, which seals the engine. Right, um, of course, your engine oil cap. You can see that's nice and clean. Uh, typically, you want to take a look under here. You can smell. If there's any uh, oil uh, or rather fuel smell right if you have a fuel smell in there obviously you can you know means that you might have oil dilution um, it's important to put this back on tighten it up don't tighten it over tighten it but you just want to make sure it's sealed right um, or else the engine is not going to be sealed and it has to be um, another thing is there's your dipstick so this is where you can Check your oil. I just changed the oil, so that's why, look how clean that is. All right. So you put back that back in. Make sure it's not just sitting loose because believe it or not, that it needs to be sealed basically for uh, crankcase pressure. All right. If you don't seal it, um, meaning that if this is, if you're missing, let's say if you're missing this thing, like you forget to put this back in, uh, the engine's gonna show a fault code. It, there's sensors to to sense the, uh, the the pressure sort of thing, right? And uh, yeah, so that's where you add the oil. If you need to add oil, check oil, dipstick. What else can I tell you guys? This is probably here. The um, looks like the compressor of some type. This here most likely. It's uh, to do with the AC unit, HVAC unit, engine mount. See this, this engine is mounted by uh, this mechanism right here to the frame. And there's a little bit of dirt there, so I'm just gonna wipe it down. So um, the reason why you wanna keep your engine nice and clean is, is just to, you know, make it easy on anyone that needs to work on it, right? Um, and you know, the cleaner the engine compartment is, it basically will uh, prevent, you know, uh, uh, dust and dirt and contaminants from getting inside. Let's say if you're actually working on the engine and you, or even checking the oil dipstick, if there's a lot of like crud around here, it could fall in, right? That's the idea. Same thing with that part. You know, um, the cleaner the engine compartment it is, the better. Um, and of course, you know, when, you know, when you open the hood, it doesn't look like garbage, right? And it's a good idea to open up that's up and check once in a while because um, I believe, um, according to some of, the, uh, some of the mechanics, this area has some soy-based wiring, right, in here. And basically, because it has soy-based wiring, um, it attracts rodents like rats and if you open up your engine hood and you ever see this like just like um loose droppings of like uh, rat droppings if you guys ever seen that before it's just little pellets right and uh, you know black usually is like black dark brown sort of thing if you see that that means there's uh rat infestation in your engine and the reason why rats like to stay in the engine bay uh, is because it's warm, especially in the winter. Um, they sort of cuddle up in like these areas. And if they smell the soy-based wiring, they'll chew on it and literally eat it. And um, uh, that's uh, that sucks because, you know, if they chew through a wire, it's gonna um, give you a bunch of engine issues, right? Obviously. And uh, and the reason why Honda used that is because you know it's quote unquote you know environmentally friendly because it's soy based right instead of uh, I guess oil based um, you know petroleum based right so it's supposed to be a 
a grain type initiative. And yeah, so, you know, some of the hoses, wipe, wipe it gently. You don't want to, you don't want to basically, you know, unseat things. Uh, but uh, you can see these, these tubes sometimes, I think that's to do with the vent, some ventilation uh, system. Maybe it's the PCV. Actually, I'm not too sure what this one is, but maybe it's the PCV. If you guys know, let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, so you see all these hoses, you just want to gently wipe. You don't want to, you know, damage anything as you're doing this, right? So gently wipe in places. If you're not too sure, don't touch it, right? Um, what else? Uh, obviously, here's your uh, uh, coolant. It goes in the radio. This is your radiator. Your turbo is actually here. The, tur the turbo's in the front here. Uh, so the exhaust, this engine breathes this way. So the exhaust goes out that way, the intakes on this side. So this is the air box, air goes into here. Here's a bit of a air resonator here, and it goes into the turbo section, which it gets forced into the engine through this side, I believe. Um, and, um, and then, like I said, this is the exhaust side. So here's your turbo. So this part here, there's a, you guys can't see it because it's uh, covered by this uh, resonator, but there's a hand with an X on it. So basically don't touch this. This is already, there is already like a, uh, like a cover for that turbo section there uh, because the turbo gets super hot. Like we're talking about the hottest part of the car, of this car is gonna be the turbo. Um, super hot, the, the uh, engine um, basically uses the turbo to, uh, to, to, to force in induction, for force induction, right? So basically, the, uh, there's turbines that uh, get turned by the exhaust gases. And exhaust gases, as you know, gets really hot. So it uh, goes through the exhaust, turns the turbines, in which case turns another set of turbines that um, forced fresh air into the engine. Um, and that's what turbo uh, does, right? And the problem is though, because those two turbines, two sets of turbines are connected, um, there's some bearings. Uh, sometimes some, some of them use ball bearings. Some of them use needle bearings. Uh, regardless, so there's some sort of bearing in there that gets lubricated by your regular engine oil. Okay, so because the um, engine oil cools down that turbo too, and because the turbo runs so hot, right, that you always need constant oil pressure and recirculating oil and recirculating air to cool down the uh, turbo, um, the whole unit basically. And the most important parts of the turbo is parts like moving parts, like the wastegate and uh, the actual uh, ball bearings or the, sorry, the bearings, right? Sometimes they have, I think these ones probably have needle bearings. And those needle bearings, if they stop mid uh, cycle of your driving, uh, you know, because of things like auto stop start, right? Basically, there's no oil recirculating. Yes, there's oil pressure that keeps it up, but the oil stops circulating. That's the problem. When the engine stops um, uh, 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 reciprocating, or when it stops, right, it actually stops pumping oil because this is a, uh, the, the, the oil pump in this car is not electric, right? Make, let's make it clear. The oil stops moving. So the oil that is, is where the turbo is, it starts to bake and cook. And the turbo literally, quote unquote, cokes the oil, right? And that's where you get the sludge, right? If you cook oil, basically it becomes, um, um, just, uh, it, it breaks down the oil and it becomes a solid, like crud, right? Uh, that's what happens to oil when you bake it or or, or, or heat it up too high of a temperature, right? So it br definitely breaks down, you know, the there's a bunch of detergents and, you know, oil additives and, you know, all sorts of different things that prevent that type of um, coking and sludging. 
But the problem is, as you know, uh, everyone is, you know, promoting that, you know, long, what do you call it? Long um, cycle uh, oil change intervals, right? So up to 20,000 kilometers, that's just crazy, right? 20,000 kilometers, you run the same oil, you know, you guys are running the auto stop start and it's cooking the oil, right? The other thing I want to say is that the the engine um, gets cooled by air as well. There's obviously the radiator, right? The radiator, you know, there's a, a coolant that goes through the engine to cool down the engine. Yes, the, so there's the radiator. And then another part is going to be your air. So when air goes through the engine, obviously it cools it down, right? And the air actually gets cooled by the intercooler as well, in which case, you know, that's basically cool down air to cool down the engine. And um, then you got the third thing, which is the oil, right? So the oil keeps circulating in the engine and it cools down the engine. Air keeps coming into the engine because it's on and then it keeps cool down the engine, cooling down the engine. And um, of course the radiator and it's intercooler and so on and so forth. So again, why do I say always to turn off the auto stop start function and um, and a lot of YouTubers are saying, oh, you're completely wrong. The auto stop start is a robust system and they test it and they, you know, do all this stuff to the engine to be able to run the auto stop start function. And it's a very viable system is good for the earth and blah, blah, blah. No, when you don't have air running through the engine, you don't have the oil recirculating, right? Oil pump is off. The auto stop start function will damage your engine, right? I'll say it again, it's gonna damage your engine, right? For what it's worth, for the amount of oil or gas you save, right? So the, you save gas, yes, for sure. Um, statistically, they, they did a test or they did measurements of how the average engine, um, if it's, uh, if you're at a stoplight for longer than seven seconds, the auto stop start um, stopping will save you money, meaning save fuel, yes. But, however, what you're doing is, in turn, just damaging your oil and then also damaging your engine itself because you're da damaging the turbo, right? Um, oil is not recirculating, it overheats. Well, basically, this compartment, when you're stopped at a, uh, at a light, right, um, and let's say it's 90 plus degrees Fahrenheit outside, right? And basically when the engine stops, right, there's no air coming in, you're stopped at a light, right? Um, the engine is covered by your hood and it is sitting there basically baking everything in here. Everything is baking, basically. However, if you keep your engine on idling at a stop a stoplight, right? It means that there's air still going in, like I said, and the oil pressure and oil re is recirculating and, and getting pushed through the whole, um, the, all the moving parts, right? And it's better to be on idle rather than, um, you know, having the engine off, having everything literally bake, right? Especially the oil inside uh, the turbo section because that's where it is the hottest and super hot and it really should be turned off all the time. And I, I do wish that, you know, for these type of engines, especially for, for these uh, uh, turbo engines with DGI, coupled with all these, you know, nannies for, for, um, for emissions, um, you know, they really should just stop using it. And I, you know, for the record, I know why they are doing that because there's CAFE standards, right? Uh, you know, the corporate average fuel economy standards and basically um, they um, will get tax credits and all sorts of different things, you know, that the governments are imposing so that they get tax credits and or, 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 or carbon credits or whatever, right? Those carbon credits, yeah, they, they save money, right? And for the record, I just found out that um, the longer the interchange, like the change in oil change intervals, the longer they are allowed, right, uh, the less oil that the engine needs through 
um, you know, a certain amount of time, right? Or rather a certain amount of kilometers, right? So they need less oil changes means that their uh, CAFE ratings go up, right? So not just um, uh, fuel consumption, right, affects the CAFE uh, ratings, the oil change intervals, right, change and, inc you know, basically, um, if they recommend longer oil change intervals, that will give you um, better uh, corporate average fuel economy uh, ratings. So that's why they are recommending long um, interval, uh, oil change intervals, which, yes, it's good for them, but it's bad for us, right? Just think about that for a sec. That's just, I don't know, it's just craziness for 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 the record. It's it's absolutely nuts. You guys can comment, but um, you know, let me know if I'm wrong about that. Uh, I'm all for saving the earth. I really am. I, uh, but then the problem is, at what cost? As I always say, if it costs you um, a turbo, right? How much is how much how much um, does it, does it take to make a turbo? How much carbon, um, you know, emissions does it take to make all the parts of a turbo, right? And, you know, if you keep on using your auto stop start, um, you need to do your oil change quicker, right? So you're gonna use more oil, right? So you let, use a little bit less gas, but you use more oil. It just it doesn't make any sense, right? You know, and I've always said, you know, like, if you guys really, you know, really think about it, to save the earth, the best thing to do is um, implement some system that will help humans drive less and consume less, right? I hate to say it again, right? Uh, the best way is to actually um, think of ways to be more efficient, right? Uh, lessen your trips right um uh basically you know if if you guys can work from home right that should be an initiative to allow people to work from home uh or like work share you know the problem is and i think i uh, mentioned in one of my other videos is that really they don't want to do that meaning they meaning the governments right um they really really don't want to have people drive less if they drive less and commute less, right, they have more time to stay at home and not spend. What happens when people will spend less, right? Furthermore, what happens when offices are not being used? People downsize, right? Like people, meaning the companies, realize, oh, hey, they can work from home. Okay, fine. You guys work from home. We will sell our offices or downsize our offices, right? And when you downside the offices, it means that it hurts the banks, it hurts the landlords, in turn it hurts the banks, right? So they uh, are losing money, they lose tax dollars, and then guess what? You don't spend money on food, going out to eat for lunch, or get that Starbucks for you know that hour drive or. 20 minute drive, 30 minute drive, or whatever it may be, the Starbucks lose money, right? And what happens when uh, when you guys don't go for dinner after work? Or when you guys go to the office, there's a certain amount of maintenance for the buildings too, right? So there's gonna be maintenance that, that are less needed and less people need to go there and clean, means that there's gonna be a bit of a uh, uh, you know, or a lot of damage to the economy, right? So that's what is, you know, that's basically, and that's the truth, right? That's not even speculation. That's that's just the truth because right now you can hear, you hear about the, uh, you know, especially in the U.S., there's issues with, um, like, uh, commercial real estate, right? Commer commercial real estate is a big bubble, and uh, basically when companies realize and start to really downsize, right? That's gonna cause a lot of issues with the commercial real estate. It's just gonna 
plummet, right? And um, no one really wants that. And, uh, you know, it's not as if I want uh, uh, the economy to go down, but, you know, the flip side is, if we were really, really that concerned about, you know, the, you, like, um, burning too much fuel and environmental uh, concerns, it just means that we have to consume less. That's, there's no way around it, right? No matter how um, well these engines run or how well the electric cars are, um, uh, you know, high, high mileage, uh, uh, lower uh, maintenance and whatnot for those electric cars, which is not really true. But anyways, it, it, it takes amount of, you know, resources to make those batteries, right? And uh, electric cars are really expensive to begin with. And now we know that they're, um, it is expensive to fix electric cars. And it's also expensive for the batteries to be replaced. And um, yeah, there's, is, is not, I mean, long term, electric cars are probably the best bet. Okay, so I, I admit that. Um, you know, they're gonna get better, the, everything's gonna get better in time, right? But really, um, we have to fight it with just consuming less. But mm, yeah, that's a double-edged sword, as I just explained, right? So yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And um, you know, I, I work for a, a corporation as well. Uh, so I, it's not as if I want things to slow down because you know obviously you know our pay and our jobs and our job security is tied to those big corporations doing well right uh, yeah so that's an unfortunate thing even if you're self-employed you know if you're self-employed and you have let's say a cafe or I don't know I'm just you know what, what example you want to use right if you have a car shop or you sell uh, if you're a realtor um, if you are a uh, uh, hairdresser, right? Whatever it may be, right? Or, or if, you, if you run some sort of business, if there's less people going to work, there's less people consuming, they don't have to do their hair as often, they don't have to buy so much clothes, uh, they don't, you know, have to buy so much coffee when they're out, they can make coffee at home. Um, and you know, if, if you have a business, what else uh, that, you know, really gets affected directly it, even, even, so basically I'm just trying to say that whether you work for a company or don't work for a company, you work for yourself, it does actually slow down the economy, in which case the people have less money and people, you know, even the independent, uh, uh, business owners will and can be affected. Right. So I, you know, I don't want to see anyone get hurt or whatever, you know, through, you know, through through uh, green initiatives, but at the same time, we have to, you know, improve the, our consumption, right? So, yeah, um, I know that hopefully this is not boring. Um, sometimes I like to just, especially when I have time, I like to just clean things. Um, I used to do this for my motorcycles. Uh, I used to have this, uh, my last bike was a CBR, and, a, and one of the, most famous or not famous but my favorite things to do at night you know especially when i have nothing else better to do um you know uh is is actually clean and wax the bike and look at it <laughs> I, I love riding right and I, I still do i think but um the you know the the dangers of riding coupled with the uh you know crazy drivers out there and you know it just took out all the fun, you know, especially getting caught for speeding all the time, right? Because when you're when you're in a motorcycle that is capable of doing 300 kilometers per hour and, you know, turning on a dime or stopping on a dime as well, you, you just, it's hard not to go fast. It's sort of like driving a Viper or, you know, the new NSX or a Lamborghini and not using the power. Cause it's addicting. Like electric cars are fun because they have a lot of torque, right? But they don't have that sound, that 
that visceral sound of you know, exhaust and um, you know that 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 adrenaline pumping part of having an internal combustion engine. And you know, for the ones that ride, uh, whether you have a Harley or whatever, you know, there's a noise, there's a there's there's that passion, there's that uh, that uh, primal you know thing that happens when you um, pull the throttle and it just goes and it's fun it's that that's why people like riding right um and uh it's hard not to do that it takes the fun out of it because if you're you know because riding's not fun if you're going slow right especially if, i mean it could be fun i guess if you're with your friends and you have a bunch of, you know a group of friends that ride all together and it's it's fun right fine but you know typically you know on a sunday ride in the mountains or whatever you're typically going to be speeding through the corners and um it's fun right um uh, and the problem is you know cops don't like that right because you know years ago we had that anti-racing movement because there was a bunch of street racing and then it wasn't really with motorcycles it was with cars but then it affected the motorcycle guys too like myself and then you know they're cracking down and everyone that is like riding abreast thinking that they're racing, but they're really not racing. They're just riding side by side, right? You know, it's just, yeah, it's just a bit of a pain riding, so I don't ride anymore, but I still do like the, um, the seeing the beautiful bikes that Honda is still making, Yamaha, right? Uh, the R7, which is a now, I think it's a, a, a twin. I don't know if it's a V-twin or an inline two cylinder, uh, I think it's maybe an inline two, whatever, but it's a cross plane engine and it has a really nice sound to it. It's uh, the R7 is now 700 cc two cylinder and it has about 80 or 80 so horsepower, which is not a lot, which is what I like about it because then you, you know, <laughs> uh, I used to ride uh, leader bikes, right? So, you know, I'm used to the 130, 140, 150 horsepower uh, engines. Um, and I've had uh, 600 cc uh, engines before as well, and those even those 600 ccs were about, you know, six uh, six like a CBR 600, uh, or um, I had a, the R6 Yamaha R6, and even that was like 120 horsepower back, you know, whatever 10 years ago, right? Uh, now it probably has, you know, the 600 ccs probably have closer to like, you know, 130, 135 horsepower, maybe 140 horsepower. Um, so that's a lot of horsepower. And then the leader bikes even have more, like the BMW uh, leader bike, um, CBR 1000 R R, triple R race bike, M1, the Yamaha M1 engines. They're really fast car, uh, bikes, right? Uh, Yamaha M1 R1, um, uh, super fast, right? So 0 to 60 in under three seconds. Uh, and you, could, it's, you can certainly do wheelies and have lots of fun with uh, those, those bikes. But... Uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, those, 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 those are a lot of fun. Basically, that's really the point. And um, uh, the, the R7 with uh, 80 horsepower is enough. And it sounds really cool. You guys have time, uh, take a look at clips of the new Yamaha R7 is not too expensive like it's affordable especially if you can find a used one uh maybe yeah take a look uh, I, i'm not say, saying for you guys to ride or anything but if you guys are riders already the new r7 certainly does have a very very cool sound to it instead of like that screamer um uh, sound um of you know the, the motorcycles typically you know you hear the cross rocket sound like ooh, ooh, right the R7 and the R1, because it has a cross-plane crank, okay, it has a rawr, rawr. It's like a, it's really cool. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I envy it because I've always had the screamers, like the, like the R6 and all those bikes are screamers. Um, I had a two-cylinder, uh, or yeah, three-cylinder, two-stroke engine, uh, my NS400R was one of my first bikes, and that is a very special bike because it's two-stroke, right? So a re it has a very pipey, crackly sound to it. Um, it. Lots of fun, but I mean, that was a really old bike, right? Like, that was back, way back when I started riding. Uh, I bought it from 
my buddy that taught me how to ride. Uh, he was like a mentor and, um, and uh, yeah, we became riding buddies. But uh, at, yeah, th that bike was um, my first bike, uh, 400cc. So it's not huge and two stroke. You have only power up in the top, very like a VTEC engine. Uh, you have your power up top and very little at the bottom, very little torque and horsepower at the bottom is all up in the top end, right? So uh, that was a fun bike and that's what I learned on pretty much. Um, and I had that bike for a little, quite a while actually. Um, and then I sold it and then, then I got the R6, but uh, yeah, so um, pretty much done. As you can see, you know, just basically just wiping some of the dirt, right? Some of the nooks and crannies. Um, I've, I've seen, you know, some people use like a pressure washer, like some sort of like foaming uh, engine shampoo type of thing. I'm always a little bit wary about getting like some of these electronic parts too wet uh, and, you know, blowing something, right? Like this fuse box is not water, not really waterproof, right? Um, yeah, so you can see that this clips here is not really waterproof, so I don't know. It's, I just don't think that you should spray too much water in here, basically. Um, so the next best thing is really to wipe. Right. Yeah, so... Um, I was gonna think about some of the things that I was gonna uh, bring to you guys, uh, meaning my upcoming videos. I think I've already done done the sound system one, right? With the some of the upgrades I've done, uh, and then I cu coupled that with my with the uh, sound editing videos. Um, so that's already done, right? Um, and then for oil change, I've already did the, done the oil change on this engine. And I could probably do one for the Honda CRV um, oil change because that oil change is, is pretty much due soon. Um, so I can probably do that. What else do you guys, you guys tell me what, what you guys want to see done on these cars. Um, I have, uh, I was meaning to do a, a review so I've had this car, the Civic, for about two years now. Actually, the anniversary is coming up. It's two years, pretty much exactly two years in a in a few weeks, actually. Uh, because I, I know because I just renewed my insurance, right? Um, ahead of time, right? So uh, exactly two years. And um, there's one major regret, and I'll tell you guys more about it in the in the you know like two year review video I guess um, and that is the fact that I did not go for the six speed manual this is the uh, Civic Sport Touring which is the um, right underneath the Type R right so it has this 1.5 liter engine and because this is Sport Touring I could have actually opted for the six speed manual. And I was saying to my wife, my wife, uh, my wife drives manual too. Um, uh, she she had the uh, TL uh, TSX uh, two thousand and I don't know, I can't remember two thousand late two thousands, and um, yeah, so she she had uh, the 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 six speed manual uh, uh, TSX, and she she loves you know uh, that car, and we eventually. Sold it because we needed an SUV because we had a baby on the way and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, she, she could drive manual, no problem. And I I just was talking to her, I said, like, darn it. One regret is that I, we did not go for the manual. Right, because this, this would, I know that there's a little bit of rev hang on this engine, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's not as if we're speeding around every all the time anyway. And we actually drive the uh, CRV way more, right? Um, and which means this car is sitting in, and, and, um, and, you know, we don't drive as, it as much and we typically take sh like shorter trips in this car. I use the CRV a lot more and for longer trips as well. So, um, yeah, this, this would be a really nice car 
for the weekend, especially if it was manual. I mean, don't get me wrong. I the reason why we went with the originally because like the 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 CBT. I thought the CBT was great um, um, because it's nice and smooth. There's no gear shifts involved, so you don't feel any gear shifts, and it's it is smooth, right? But the thing is, is you know, you guys know, it's not very, very sporty. That's the thing. This takes a bit of the fun away, and sometimes it gets a little bit droney, right? But if you have a six-speed manual, then uh, the drone becomes uh, obviously a lot more. Like the like the sound goes up and down a lot more, and um, especially if you put like a sport exhaust on this. But uh, yeah, if you if you put a sport exhaust on a CVT. It'll sound like loud and it just goes right, and it just is not gonna be great. Okay, so um, uh, uh, six speed manual and sport exhaust actually, it's you know, uh, there's a lot more vari variation in the RPMs and the sound goes up and down, it sounds sort of cool, you know, but um, yeah, that's one regret. But I'll, I'll uh, I think I will do that. Um, review two-year review for this car some of the some of the idiosyncrasies of this car um, good good and bad and uh, this one recall which is not an official recall in Canada yet is the sticky steering um, I have that issue so basically when I'm when I'm at a stop or actually when I'm in motion you just uh, turn your wheel a little bit it's a little bit sticky and it makes a sound too like a clicking sound which is annoying, and uh, I've already brought it up to Honda, and they said that, oh, it's, we don't have the recall yet. Uh, they said that the recall is in the US only, it didn't come up to Canada yet, which is silly. I, I don't know why they do that. But I guess maybe it's a slow rollout or something, or maybe it's to do with Transportation Canada versus, you know, uh, NHTSA, right? Uh, who knows? Uh, so, anyways, that's what, that is what it is. Uh, I've been, I'm going to bring it in, right? And I'm planning to um, try the other dealership because I didn't really have too great of an experience with the open road Honda uh, dealership locally, right? So um, uh, I have another Honda dealership that is, I guess, I think it's more of an independent. So hopefully they're better um service wise and they're a little bit closer actually to to where i live so i'm gonna give them a shot um but um i don't know sometimes i don't really have high hopes for dealerships sorry you guys if you guys work if you guys work for a dealership or something you probably know uh some of the politics or bureaucracies you know dealing with with uh with honda or you know the the master franchiser sort of idea and it's not perfect right um how long i've been talking 41 minutes wow long video um i can't believe i've been cleaning the engine for 41 minutes anyways you guys let me know if there's anything that you guys want me to go over for for the civic and the crv they're both 2022s uh I can't speak for the new, newest, latest generation CRV, but I have the 2022, which is the previous one, the last year of the previous uh, uh, design, which is the, the more of a like a wild, wilder design than the newest, uh, more mature design of the CRV, right? And this 2022 Civic Sport Touring Hatchback is the newest, latest version of the, uh, so basically the 11th generation, right? So. The newest generation if you guys have any quest specific questions shoot me you know leave a comment basically i i like i said i always try to answer all the comments uh, and questions and because my ch channel is still pretty small right so let me know if you guys have any questions and um i know that uh i'm trying to make my videos a lot more smooth and uh, flowing, right? So just bear with me. I'm gonna get better with that. Um, so please bear with me. I know that some of the you guys are sort of like watching this. I can't hear listening to this guy. 
<laughs> and that's fine. And I'm going to take the criticism because that helps me get better, right? So I will take the good and the bad. And for you guys who who uh, subscribe and um, watch and listen and give me thumbs up all the time and likes, uh, I do appreciate it. I really do appreciate you guys. Um, and like I said, I've always uh, thought that I have um, some information to share and um, thoughts and 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 just ideas and um, at the least if this helps you guys sleep <laughs> then it's uh, some sort of value to you so um, again thank you for the subscribing and likes and uh, share this with uh, people who may enjoy my babbling as well and uh, have a, it's Friday so you guys have a great weekend um, and um, I will talk to you guys soon again Take care and have a great night.